On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, What's Going On With Containers? I am your host, Sam Bercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So, containers and the container market are all over the place. I have seen so many conflicting stories that I wanted to bring you both sides of this so that you have the information because depending on who you're reading and what reports you're looking at, it is not clear about it. And let me be clear, I'm getting some indications on some things I'll reveal to you here as we go on. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the story. So here's the first story from Mike Schuller over at G-Captain. HSBC freight rates expected to rise as contract season ends and labor issues persist. So springtime is when long-term rates are negotiated. So companies are getting their long-term rates locked in for the year. And so based on this, Mike Schuller writes, the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index, one of the many indices that are out there, Experienced a slight increase, just 0.3% week on week, as carriers aim to strengthen the spot rates during the conclusion of Trans-Pacific Container Negotiations. These are the year-long uh, rates they're going to get. Several shipping lines have announced general rate increases on the Trans-Pacific Trans Head Haul Rate, effective from May 1st. However, the sustainability of these rates depends on capacity discipline and the revitalization of anticipated demand recovery in the second half of the year goes on here obviously the issue with the pma the pacific maritime association and the ilu ilw excuse me international longshore warehouse union are all at play it goes on here while this is mildly positive we think that the lack of a final agreement since the ex ex expiry of the contracts in july 2022 would remain an overhang we think this should inc encourage beneficial cargo owners to sign contracts above spot rate levels and secure capacity to ensure service reliability during a potential recovery in demand. Uh, okay, so they are predicting that even with everything going on, that we're going to expect to see a signing of long-term rates and a bit of an upturk, uh, uptick. Then you come over to this story over in Freight Waves by Greg Miller, and it is not as positive as you'll see. Container shipping warning, green shoots are transitory illusionary. This is based on a report from Drury's. And Drury's, along with HBSC, are big kind of groups that analyze this stuff. So I just want to read part of the introduction here. The signals have been flashing green in container shipping of late. Spot rates are up, which is true. Uh, charter rates and durations are up. All good. Secondhand ship sales are brisk and asset prices are rising. Idle tonnage is down. Carriers are sending many old vessels for demolition. The warning Tuesday from the leading container shipping consultancy Drury's, those single signals won't be flashing green much longer. Okay, those are big warnings because based on everything that's been happening, it looks good. We just saw latest reports from Liner Lytica and a few other groups saying that everything was pretty stable, but this is of concern. Why is that? It goes on here. This is from Simon Haney, the editor of Drury's Container Forecaster. Uh, we would be confident if the foundations for recovery were in place, but we don't see them. Without those building blocks in place, we view the uptick in spot rates and char charter hire as illusionary. Okay, it's disturbing. Volumes remain very weak. The order book for this year and next is vast, and we will start to land with more vengeance very soon. The bill is due on the ordering frenzy we saw in 2021. The timing of deliveries couldn't be much worse, coinciding with a slump in volume and as new builds flood in pressures on both markets freight and chartering is going to become an irresistible force that owners and operators are not going to be able to bat away what's bad news for shipping lines is good news for u.s importers at least in terms of freight costs drew is now protecting low rates through 2024 all right Let's break this down a bit and talk about what's going on here. And Greg is always very methodically lays this out. And I'm going to emphasize some points because of what I am hearing from people out in the industry. So number one, failure to scrap. Everybody, including myself, expected to see vessels piled up on the beaches off Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan being scrapped. However, 
It's not. Drury currently estimates gl global throughput will increase 1% this year, far below the capacity. Uh, and it's expected to grow to 4.7%. But when you take away the comfort blanket of poor congestion with ships turning around quicker, the rise in effective capacity is going to be far higher at 25% year on year. There are more ships out there than ever before. Now, we don't know whether that continues. I, 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 I do have an issue with this, that there is going to be a push to get rid of older tonnage. There has to be. Or they're going to be pushed and relegated into trades beyond the Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic. So back in December, Drury had predicted that there'd be about 900,000 TEUs worth of shipping recycled this year. It's now way below it. Only a third of that has happened. And again, this goes to the issue with the massive influx of new vessels coming in. This is the forecast for new vessels coming in, and it is big. And when I say big, it's a lot of vessels and a lot of capacity coming in. You're seeing the introduction of new ultra-large container vessels. Those are only on the Asia to Europe run, but it is the Neo Panamax vessels, these ones, the 13 to 15,000 TEU, that are going to be displacing a lot of ships. You're going to see those ships go on the run to the west coast of the United States and to the east coast of the United States in particular or excuse me, 7,000 above, those are going to be feeder vessels going in. So a lot of tonnage that is on the routes now are going to get regulated to other areas. The question is, do they get scrapped or don't they get scrapped? And again, they're going to be used as long as they can efficiently use. What everyone wasn't, I think, taking into account is IMO 2023 is as those older vessels start scoring badly on their IMO reports, then you're going to see them head for scrap. But that may be a few years from now. That's where Greg talks about the fuel efficiency, fuel efficient ships and non-fuel efficient ships still in. He noted that 81% of new buildings uh, ordered from January to March 2022-2023 uh, are for dual fuel designs, meaning they can shift over to LNG, other fuel sources that are clean and efficient. Uh, goes on here, I don't think that anyone could sensibly argue against the requirements for a moral and financial perspective to make the fleet more fuel efficient and less damaging to the environment. Where owners are falling down is on the other side of things. They're simply not removing enough of the older, more heavily polluting ships the order book should be replacing. That's because very low sulfur fuel is really expensive. And if you have a ship with a scrubber, you can go ahead and burn the high sulfur fuel that is still out there and usable. It's only going to change when countries mandate only vo very low sulfur fuel ships coming in, or you can't offload the scrubber water anymore. Goes on here, we got it wrong. Man, how often do you hear people say this? But that is exactly what it says. Uh, according to Heaney, uh, in October, Drury predicted that the carriers would ultimately make the right capacity, um, uh, right capacity management choices to engineer a soft landing. Can I be clear? <laughs> when, when I, I was always worried about this, because when the shipping companies are flush with cash, they are drunk on profits. Uh, you can't expect them to make the right decision. I mean, come on, drunk sailors never make the right decision. And why would we think the shipping companies would make a right decision? They should have been phasing out tonnage. They should have been scrapping. They're not. Instead, they are reaping the whirlwind that they sowed. And, and you can hardly blame them for that. Goes on here, I'm never afraid to put my hand up and say we got it wrong. And that is why we'll try to do better in the future. Man, God bless him for saying that, because very few people will say that they did it. We misjudged the fact that even though the market was more concentrated and alliances seemed more streamlined, it was still about prioritization of short-term gains as opposed to the long-term picture in terms of the market balance. I think the other issue that's behind the scenes here is the realignment of the container alliances with uh, Maersk and, uh, and, and MSC breaking their alliance, the 2M alliance in 20. 25, there is going to be a scramble here. And I think everybody wants to be positioned to maximize their potential to be a standalone carrier. Goes into the forecast here. What is that forecast? So here it is uh, from Descartes showing you the volumes for 2023. Everyone is expecting April, May, June, July to be an uptick to see those container volumes kick back. We, you know, we hit the the, the kind of the hockey stick here where we kind of hit the bottom and come back up. Because if you look from January, February to March, you see that bend in. And the only time you see it going down was in 2019, 2020. You saw an uptick in 2023 and you've looked at the forecast, they have it going up. The question is, does it? Does it keep going up? And that's a lot of dependent on the economy in the United States and in Europe. 
So looking at 2024, we're seeing a forecast for weak rates coming in, especially with the fight on the West Coast, uh, the, the, the literally begging for traffic to come into LA and Long Beach, Oakland, Seattle, Tacoma, you're going to see freight rates really, really ro- low. Excuse me. Uh, Drury now projects that freight rates will fall 59.8% year on year and in 2023 on a global basis, it expects average rates to drop 68.4% on the mainland East West trades. Now, I, I will say this, there is a question about the issue of how much LA and Long Beach will do to entice trade in there versus the trade shift to the east and Gulf Coast, because a lot of it is reliability. And there is not a view that the West Coast is reliable right now, because not just the ports and not just because of ILWU and PMA, Class 1 railways, uh, environmental laws coming out of California, uh, issues with trucking. I mean, you name it. There's a whole slew of things. And now you have a lot of companies that have shifted the delivery of their containers to the East and Gulf Coast. And many have multifaceted this, where they can come into any area. They can come into the West Coast, they can come into the Gulf Coast, they can come into the East Coast. So they're not wholly dependent on coming in through LA and Long Beach. They may be doing, you know, 20, 30, 50% here and there, which makes it so that if one port hits a log jam, they are not completely screwed. And I think that is a big issue here. Finally, the last part that uh, Greg mentions here, shipping lines are projected to sink into red. Uh, Add it all up, the consultancy sees reduced earnings for the ocean carriers in 2023 and losses in 2024. Now let's caveat losses here for a second. Uh, According to their methodology, the container container line industry earned aggregate, the EBIT, is a $296 billion in 2022, a staggering amount. Yes, that's 37%. Uh, ver- above 2021. But if you look at EBIT, it was 49% last year versus 45% 2021. Drury expects the earned EBIT to be $16.5 billion in 2023. That's a decline of 94%. 94% from last year. But hang on a second. Let's put this into context. Look at where they were in 2019. Look at where they were in 2020, 2021, 2022. They have made huge profits. And the reason you see all this tonnage coming in is because they can pay for it up front. They are putting the down payment and if not paying up front for new tonnage, that's what they're doing. And so, of course, you see ship. You can sit there and argue, wow, they shouldn't be ordering ships now. They should do it, you know, a phased approach. No, they have money now. They're going to spend it so that the ships are paid off. They much rather have paid off ships and operate bigger ships with less capacity on board than not have them. And that is the big issue here. Of course, they were going to buy tonnage. Everybody knew they were going to buy tonnage. It is not a surprise they're doing it. And once this tonnage is in hand, they'll phase out. They are not going to phase out anything until they have their ships in hand. Let's be clear about that. And they're going to reshuffle routes. They're going to figure out priorities. We're going to see how those vessel uh, liner sharing agreements work out here. And you may see alliances begin to fracture even sooner here as this new capacity comes online and you don't need to line or share anymore. You're about to see container wars, I think, happen between the container lines. Go back to Hanjin Marines collapse of 2016. Next year should see carriers in the red on the EBIT basis, according to Drury. It's newly introduced forecast for 2024 is an industry-wide EBIT of $10 billion. That's still a profit. And they're still making a profit. Yeah, they're not making Facebook, Amazon profit, but they're doing pretty good. Liners are going to be able to cope with those losses because they built up significant cash bumpers, but it's going to be a harder landing than it might others otherwise been if they acted sooner. Yeah, should they have acted better? Yeah, they should have. But again, it's a company. And a lot of these companies, for example, MSC, doesn't, you know, it's not a privately, you know, it's a privately owned company. It's not even stock traded. And so it really depends on how these companies operate. Some of these companies are seat of their pants, even though they're big, huge, massive corporations, they are family owned and family run. And that's the amazing thing about shipping. You make money in shipping when profitability goes through the roof. You make it and then you run. That's it. Because if you look at the decade before COVID hit, you would have seen years where they're losing money, making a little bit of profit, almost no money at all. And so when they have cash, they're going to invest it. And the thing they're going to invest in is ships. And that's what you see shipping companies doing. 
not a big surprise, but for many people, they're going to be shocked by it because they're just learning about how the shipping industry operates. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you support the page? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly yearly subscriber. Also head on over to Freight Waves, to G-Captain, to all the sites that list this. I love reading them all and then the, putting them together. I just took two stories out of the plethora I read to kind of put it together for you about what to expect here with containers. Until our next story, this is Sal signing off.